you were saying, even if yours is only one, I guess. She's a very policy-driven person. She'd always been a slight outsider within the government. We're going to now deliberately pin this on Truss and Quartang. Lily Boris reluctantly swung behind Rishi Sunak on that. No, yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. He did not die yeah, yeah, his yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Consensual, she brought people in. She had to over coal supplies because they're not ready. <laughs> and from then, I think it was a trade Well, welcome, 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 ladies and gentlemen, to this IA Book Club event. If you don't know me, my name's Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General here at the IEA. And uh, heartfelt congratulations to those of you who have actually made it to the IEA, braving the weather and train delays and God knows what else. And a warm welcome also to those of you uh, who are watching this event after it's taken place on YouTube. Uh, we're here to talk through this rather marvellous tome, Out of the Blue, the inside story of the unexpected rise and rapid fall of Liz Truss. Um, the authors of the book are Harry Cole, um, who is the political editor of The Sun. You used to be at the Mail on Sunday, yes, Mark, yeah. and James Heal, the diary editor of The Spectator. Also, you're at the Mail on yeah. Sunday, right? So, you, you are the authors of this great tome, which I, I assume when you started it didn't have the and rapid fall of Liz Truss as the, as the subtitle, is it? It went through a couple of cosmetic changes. A couple of cosmetic <laughs> changes, okay. Uh, let me just say about far, I'm going to ask Harry and James some questions uh, for about half an hour, 40 minutes or so, then we'll come over to the live audience in the room. So if you've got a burning question, keep it in your mind and I, I will come over, uh, come over to you at the end of the session. So uh, Harry, let me start with you. When you... Um, set out to, why did you set out to write this book and when you did did you think that Liz Truss's premiership would be finished before the book was? Uh, well so at the unexpected rise I think we uh, went through a kind of, we, I think originally it was an astonishing rise and I do think it was astonishing because she'd been in the cabinet um, for a very long time, she'd been a minister for a very long time, this is indeed the first month in ten years that Liz Truss is not in government. Mm -hmm. Having said that she was also something of an enigma um, to the wider voter um, she was able to sort of pay, uh, be lots of things to lots of different people during the campaign to become Prime Minister. And uh, James and I both agree that actually the voter uh, and the reader, you know, there's a very interesting story to show how she did it because it's quite an unorthodox rise. It's very rare that someone who stays around for that long on the front line then steps up to the top job. And having known her for the better part of that 10 years and seen how she operates, seen how she. Uh, got to the top. We thought it was an interesting story to tell, and um, I thought it would have been it would have been fascinating, even if she was still in office now. Right, you were, but you were initially planning on volume two and volume three, which well, won't now need to be written. Good, I, as a political journalist, based in Westminster, there's no harm in, in, in being you know being the prime, prime minister's biographer. It yeah. turns out to be her obituary. Her obituary well, yeah, 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 presumably. You were there, I mean, it will be the only definitive biography. Like exactly. Change, yeah. First, last, and only. And uh, <laughs> a rival book was being planned for that by Lord Ashcroft and. Uh, He's had to change it to a more sort of general guide to Tory in fighting civil wars. Right, OK. Probably well, yeah, that, that will be several <laughs> volumes then, even <laughs> if yours is only one, I guess. Um, so let, let, I, I, I'm interested to try and pick apart what we think about uh, Truss as a politician and her ideology. The IEA is obviously particularly interested in economics, but interested in political economy uh, too. Um, and James, let me start with you because, I, and for full disclosure here, some, some of you watching this or here might know, I, I first met Liz when she was, I think, 18 years old, maybe 19 years old at Oxford University. Haven't known her continually since then, picked up with her again when she became an MP. But can we discern from her early years already the, uh, the, the elements of trussism or trussonomics that she came to frame in her later years, or has she been on some gigantic political journey since her childhood, James? So I think we took the view that she hasn't been on a huge journey in the sense that she was always someone who was interested in you know, social liberalism, uh, economics, a sort of policy, a very policy-driven person. And actually, you look at the earliest mentions of her as a Lib Dem student at an Oxford University, and they're pretty consistent with the kind of woman we know now, um, someone who uh, often shoot from the hip, someone who is independent-minded, quite bloody-minded, um, not afraid to go against kind of conventional wisdom, shall we say, 
and always had that interest in um, economics, free market thinking. And uh, starting fights. And starting fights, yeah. <laughs> uh, what were the best fights that she started? Well, there was one calling, for the, calling for the Queen to, the monarchy to be abolished at the, after the death of the Queen at a Lib Dem conference. I, telling what, what was a, a pretty good fight. I think someone who, uh, <laughs> who had a fight with her boyfriend, she told me. Just to clarify that, she called for the monarchy to be abolished at some point in the future yes. when the Queen died. Yes, yeah, exactly. The Queen had not died yeah, at this conference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When she was at university, one of her boys, someone had a fight with her boyfriend, she said, I hope you drown in Nuffield Pond, which is a pond in Oxford. And so she was always fun of a sort of um, quite a good uh, turn of phrase. And, uh, you know, yeah, as people say, you know, she hasn't really changed that much. Um, and that's part of her appeal, but also perhaps maybe the reason why she somehow, she somehow said the wrong thing and that kind of compounded her in moments of political difficulty of the last few months in 2022. Um. Go, again, going back to her younger years, um, and I spoke to you about my mm. dim distant recollections of her. Yeah, she was sort of outspoken. Do you think you can, we might come to her ideology in a minute, but it, Harry, it, it, do you sense, despite her sort of 10 years in the cabinet or whatever, that she, is she an establishment figure or an anti-establishment figure? She is an anti-establishment figure who is a product of the establishment. She's a career politician, there's no escaping it. She's wanted that job since probably you knew her when she was 18, and she's determined to determinedly set her mind around getting it. Now, you know, you could call her, you can accuse her of being an ideological flip-flopper, a Lib Dem who became a Tory. I think, you know, joining the Tory party in 1996 wasn't a particularly popular thing to do, but I reckon you've probably got a better chance of being an MP as a Tory than a Lib Dem. Well, buy when share prices are low. Exactly, yeah, yeah. and I think, I think there's an argument that she personally makes is actually the Tory party came to her rather than um, rather than, than her moving in any, in any substantial way. But that said, you know, on the way up, you know, when, when Osborne was in the ascendancy, she was an Osborneite. When Boris was in the ascendancy, she was a Borisista? What do we call them these days? A yes, Borisite. Yeah. Um, and then suddenly, you know, when she got up to the top, she was a Trussite, and actually then we turn around and go, well, actually, what is that? And it's actually not that popular, it turns out, in, with all of her colleagues. And actually, she was left quite exposed because she'd always been, it, it, to her advantage and her disadvantage, she'd always been a slight outsider within the government. So she was able to avoid the bitterness of the Brexit wars because she was squirreling away as number two at the Treasury, giving speeches at the IEA and launching Freer and things like that, and able to sort of step back from that. Same with COVID. She was the Trade Secretary during COVID, so she missed those really bitter, grim cabinet mm -hmm. battles about lifting lockdown. She just wasn't on the committee. So in a way, she was able to actually protect herself a little bit by keeping her hands clean for so long. But that said, she was at the very centre of it and stayed there, with, you know, watching people rise and fall and thinking, I'm not going to make those same mistakes. I'm going to do everything really quickly because mm -hmm. otherwise you just get bogged down and stuff. Mm -hmm. Just want to uh, explore a bit further her so-called political journey because it's mm. it, it, it's one it's that off the book. It, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it is. Um, it's one that some people think I've been on myself. I mean, I knew her as a fellow member of the Oxford University Liberal Club, mm. and was uh, very sympathetic to the European Union at the time. Mm. My recollection, but it's only my recollection. I haven't sort of gone through the newspapers at the time. Was oddly enough, in the early to mid nineties. Uh, at Oxford University, but I think this was a reflection of the world as a whole. Economics wasn't a particularly controversial area. I mean, I, I haven't gone through all my Oxford Union term cards and looked at what we were debating, but the economy has been the sort of dominant, you know, political issue of the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. But back in the 90s, there was a kind of post-Thatcherite consensus, really. I mean, OK, the, the Labour Party lose the 1992 election but then moved to John Smith and then Tony Blair. And I, I just don't recall having arguments, at, you know, late into the night with my fellow students about tax rates or over-regulation or government spending. It was much more about social liberalism, civil liberties, our future in the world, EU federalism, <laughs> yeah. Uh, these, these sort of issues. And really, I mean, there were differences on economic mm. policy, but not many. Yeah, and also, if you recall, I mean, you look at the Eurosceptics at that time at Oxford, they were regarded as a fringe group and it was very much a sort of Tory party internal differences thing. So people like Jacob Rees-Mogg, a little bit older than Liz, who's Oxford, Daniel Hannan, who started the campaign for an independent Britain. At that point, it was very much confined to very Tory circles and it later became a much more national thing, I think. And I think, yeah, that's partly the story is that, you know, 
as Steve Davies, your great colleague, would say, you know, economic consensus tend to last about sort of 30 to 40 years, and in that time it was kind of the post-Thatcher, uh, pre-2008, pre-2016, whatever you want to call it, economic consensus. And so Liz, it wasn't really that so much of an issue, I, I, I'd say. It was m more, uh, yeah, Europe was okay, later to prove a kind of flashpoint within the Tory party, but at the time, as you say, it wasn't a, a huge thing, and uh, that's why it doesn't reflect her thinking at that point. I think also that she managed to, again, avoid that getting too involved in that. I think the, the campaigning as the Euro was quite uh, formative for her, but from a not from a particularly Eurosceptic point of view, policy. more from a monetary policy point of view. But I did think that also there's a point um, when she stands very early on, I think in, in uh, James, you have to remind me what the seat's called, in the York, to, oh, in, in 2005 election Hemsworth. in Hemsworth. Yes. 2001. 2001 election. Save the pound. And she's running the Save the Pound street stall and actually notices, starts to pick up on the fact that 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 sentiment is there, the the the, the, the sort of the, the, the red, red wall, wall so to speak. Existed. Where's Hemsworth for giving up near uh, Newcastle? West Yorkshire. Yeah. West Yorkshire okay. Was right. was up for grabs because just from manning the keep the pound street uh, um, stall in the street, and I think that in the high street, I think that's the sort of first time you really actually notice her getting involved in that issue. But again. I think for her, Europe was something of a distraction. She was far more interested in the, in the wonky economics than, than having a fight about Europe. And I, I think a wise man said you know, she didn't want to give the... The juice wasn't worse than the squeeze, as yeah. someone said. Very think. wise man. <laughs> she's, she's a wonk. She's a policy wonk in the sense that I don't think she gets... She's very, I think, in some ways, very rational and kind of sober about these things. Unlike a lot of Tories who... You know, necessarily were motivated by you know joining at Oxford, like you know the Cambridge for Independent by the flag and the monarch, whatever. What do we want to say? I think she was basically someone who went against the euro and against the Lib Dems. She had the Lib Dems because of the 1P policy on tax, and so she was much more interested in tax and economics than a lot of politicians are. Goes, goes and obviously works for reform, and then she looks at the 2016 referendum and she basically thinks that it's not really worth one of the top 20 issues mm -hmm, she considers mm -hmm. facing the UK. And that therefore she thinks all the strap from more important issues around tax yep. and regulation to spend. So for her, it's more, more as you said, like monetary policy. And also, there's an argument that I'm, try, I'm trying to keep you guys roughly chronological. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, um, we, we, we will yeah, come. The the uh, uh, shrouded in some degree of mystery, although I think you've uncovered quite a lot of it. But when I was speaking to you while you were drafting the book, was what uh, what was the particular thing that led her to leave the Liberal Democrat Party and join the Conservatives? Um, what triggered that? Was that just raw ambition? Was it uh, a feeling that, I mean, you've mentioned the 1p tax rate, that the Liberal Democrats had a policy of increasing income tax by a penny in order to put more funding into state education. It was a very popular policy, but I latterly discovered that it was a very popular policy in large part because the electorate believed they were literally being asked for a single penny <laughs> in additional tax. <laughs> but they didn't really clock it as, no, no, it's 1% of your entire income we're coming after. They literally thought, I mean, surely if everybody just puts a penny in, we'll have a lot more money. <laughs> it seemed like a trivial sort of thing. So what was the, I mean, it, you know, I mean, other politicians have done it, mm. obviously, but what, what do you think triggers that? Switch. It's quite a big thing to do, especially once you've invested a good number of years I building up your networks in one political party. Her, heart, you know, her head was, was, was changing through just through basic study of economics at university. There's a lovely bit in the book, which is one of my favourite bits actually, which is in a car with Simon Hughes. And they're having a row um, about, um, about capping uh, a CEO salaries to tagging to CEO salaries to the average, average, wage, wage, rise, of the yeah. average wage rise of the worker in, in an organisation. And she's very passionately saying this is a mental idea. And Simon Hughes is, is getting more and more exasperated. They're on their way to protest against the expansion of the M11, I think. Um, uh, that was part of the anti-growth agenda there. Yeah, yeah, um, so she was part of the anti-growth <laughs> coalition at that time. Yeah, um, right. So, uh, and, then, and, and, and Simon Hughes basically says to her, Liz, you're just a Tory. And I think that was a sort of triggering moment mm -hmm. that, um, that, that she points to personally as a, as a key moment of her political journey when she went, well, actually, yes, I am. But at the time, you've got to remember, you know, the Tory party, uh, you know, was still in its back to basics grimness, you know, it was on the decline. Section 28 was, you know, the, the big political issue for someone who's quite socially liberal. She had to hold her nose. So, so do you think that was a, a slightly cynical move? I mean, yeah. I've never discussed this with her, but did she sort of decide, actually, you know, I've done politics, but loads of people do politics at university yeah. without any real intention or hope or expectation of a, of a full-blown political career. So, she, so did she sort of decide, actually, I want to become an MP and a minister and prime minister, and therefore I need to pick one of the two big parties well, rather think, than... Simon, um, Harry's told about the Liz Truss's encounter with one future Lib Dem MP, Simon Hughes, 
Uh, another one is with Tim Farron. Tim Farron was running uh, in the 90s a session, he was a Lib Dem activist at the time, a session with uh, Lib Dem students across the country. And I think he cracks some sort of joke where he says, uh, you know, if you want to be in power, you don't want to do this. And he thinks seeing Liz Truss in that very class when he made a joke about it. So he, he then said in this year that he's probably to blame for the entire rise of Liz Truss <laughs> as a Tory Prime Minister. Right. I think you've got to look at where she came from as well, in the fact that when she joined the Lib Dem, she was, you know, she'd grown up in a very left wing household. You know, her mother She'd was been on C and D protests. C and D like protests. Her yeah. father was extremely left wing. Remains extremely left wing. Her mother's a bit more mellowed these days. But you know, what she calls the Lib Dems the acceptable face of right wingery in 1980s Leeds. So you know, it was to join the Lib Dems. You know, was was in itself a protest against. Her that was already a move to the right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 She was already shifting to the right. And then I think she basically realised that having spent some time with them, spoken them, met Tories, mm. actually met Tories for the first time at university. Three years later, she thinks, well, actually, they're not. You know, they don't have two heads and eat babies. Actually, some of them are all right. Mm -hmm. Some of them are total wet and you know wear tweed jackets and march around drinking port and right. wearing yeah. gowns. You know, ignore them. But some of them are all right. Those would be. I, I, I remember that at university that she she oddly for someone I think I mentioned it to to you guys as well oddly for someone who goes on to develop you know notwithstanding that her premiership ended in catastrophe but a very successful political career by any standards <laughs> yeah. being, you you usually find these people at the core of the Oxford establishment mm. uh, an Oxford Union hack as they're called giving endless speeches and trying to become president of the union and these are the ones who go on I mean both Boris, Boris Johnson was you know president mm. of the union I believe yeah, Michael, Gove. Um, Michael Gove others um, who go on to great political success have no involvement in Oxford University politics at all. Yeah, I mean, I think David Harold Cameron. Wilson was just an academic. David, David Cameron, Cameron might have been, said, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> might have just been a rank and file member of the. But, but uh, no, no. and she was this odd mix of being involved in politics but not being involved in the Oxford Union Debating Society, which is supposedly the go-to sort of network for for past the port it's, type. Yeah, it's seems she spent more time, and James will fill you in on this more because he been up there and read all the archives and read all the papers, but spent more time with the Oxford Student Union. Yeah, which is obviously a, obviously a distinction with the... That's the, like the, the National running, Union yeah, of Students. Exactly. And yeah. rather, would rather we have fights with Labour at that than, yeah. than you know, talk Drink to, port with the wet Tories at um, the Oxford who Union. Who is it? Damien Collins and, and Co. Michael Hiddleston, those types. At the, yeah, at the, at the, at the Union, yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I think she was always, as I say, much more interested in policy and kind of, you know, this very obscure, unrewarding Oxford Union, Student Union rather than the Oxford Union its Grand Chamber. And I think that's something you see later. I don't think she particularly has much time for kind of establishments like, you know, the House of Commons. She's not a great House of Commons woman. She's not someone who, you know, sort of cozies up to the Foreign Office managers when she was in that role. So I think that's kind of a consistent thread of her career. And yeah, there was a, a, there's early stories about her as a culture warrior and uh, being cancelled by the Oxford Union Student <laughs> Union for daring to question the role of a, an LGBT officer in the early 90s. Um, so very much a forerunner. And obviously she got later made Minister for Equalities and Women. Which yep. That goes back to what your original question there, which is, was a very good question. Was, is she, <laughs> she anti-establishment? Yes. That, again, that sniffiness about that particular bit of it, the old boys network, mm -hmm. I think, stayed with her all the way through her career. And actually, there's always been quite a, you know, she's always been quite a champion of, 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 of doing things independently, mm -hmm. helping mm -hmm. other women as well, and, and, and basically sticking it to that sort of closed rank network. Now, I want to, th th this is the bit I need to know more about because this is when I lose touch with her. What the hell does she do after leaving university b and before becoming a Member of Parliament in 2010? And when is it, when is it obvious that she's going to pursue a political career? She went and worked for Shell, was it? Yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, most people don't end up in the House of Commons. They end mm. up working for big companies like Shell and making quite a lot of money. Yeah. When, when, does, when does it become obvious, either to her or to the world at large, that she's going to enter the world of politics? Well, she she leaves Oxford in 1996 and she goes to her first Tory conference. She meets her husband Hugh there. She dyes her hair blonde. We've got the world exclusive on moving <laughs> to London last time to ask the Prime Minister when she, she changed her hair and sort of. She, she, used to she, had, she loved that question, yeah. yeah. <laughs> really frost Nixon, you know. Um, but it was. Um, she comes to London and I think she clearly she joins the Deptford Conservatives from the start. Um, she stands for council election. She's running the um, local branch of the Deptford Conservatives by the age of. I think 23, and then she... But this isn't a surefire route to becoming Prime Minister, no, 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 right? But, this I is just, but I think she weaved her, her social life, and, and even to this day, I think she does this, and she mm. did it at university, she weaves her social life and her political She's ambitions political into group. the same thing. Mm. She meets her husband at Tory conference. They go, they, they go, their first date is they go leafleting together. Right. You couldn't How be, romantic. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't be more of a sort of party yeah. apparatchik mm -hmm. at that stage. 
And then it's always about, right, OK, they both agreed to stand for council on no-hope wards, and then they both agreed to try and go on the candidates list. And slowly and slowly, she spends more and more time doing the politics and doing the shell. Yeah. Um, so then starts to move her, her entire career towards... Mm-hmm giving her more time to do politics. So she goes works in telecoms, which is a, less work, but you know, a bit more sexy, a bit more snazzy at the time. And then eventually she moves to a think tank because she's not... Yeah, this time. is interesting. It's all, about uh, it's all you, just, you can just see it. It's not radicalisation as such, but you can see the, the, the political bug takes over her entire life, but she always surrounds herself with mm-hmm. people who are also, you know, of a political... Uh, 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 political uh, she is, I mean, one, one of her former rivals said to her, she was firing off applications to anywhere across the country with a shamelessness, with a smile. She's basically trying to stand everywhere, and yet she looked through, like, you know, the Times, the Telegraph of the early noughties. She's, she's willing to stand anywhere, dozens and dozens of rejections. She, she runs for council three times, she loses the first two, she stands in the 2001-2005 election. 2005, she thinks she's going to get it. So Which seat was that in 2005? 2005, the um, right. And uh, yeah, so she, she stands in these seats, and I think she was devastated. She she thought up until election night she was going to win in 2005 and potentially. She turned up the count th- with a speech in her back, in her pocket. Yeah, yeah. She, she looks really part of the camera and kind of like revolution in 2005. And she's a, a consistent uh, moderniser throughout. So she backs Portillo in 2001, she supports Cameron in 2005, but they're not very involved. Um, and it's clearly just doing you know, very obviously quite sort of career politician moves from an early age. Uh, interestingly, she, when she goes for her shell application, she gets told she could be a B1. You know, is it B1? The, uh, she she could, yeah, she's on the, basically the corporate fast track. Right. She would have gone on... What's a B1 mean? So they basically, they do a, a, a graduate scheme, they sort of an, a, analyse each candidate based on what they, where they think you could, you could be at the top, A, and then, you know, she was basically at the very, very top of the graduate intake. Well, simply A ones. The well, A, yeah, well, A, 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 A was very rare, but, you know, B was, you know, she was on, she was on the path right. of, you know, corporate... Corporate well, greatness. not the top leadership. They said she could be, you know, a senior manager by a mid-40s. Exactly. Right. So, which um, didn't really appeal to her. I don't um, think. So I think, you know, she could have gone the other way, but obviously the politics just seeped into everywhere. Now, the bit I want to tease out from the IEA angle, it's interesting to understand this woman's personality and career development. Is that, and you know, I've, I got to know her fairly well, but unusually for a politician, and both of you have touched on this already, she was a real policy wonk. Mm. Now, I mean, it sounds a bit ridiculous to say politicians aren't interested in policy, but but there's some truth to that. She is obsessed with policy, and um, I'm pretty sure it's difficult to prove it from the archives, but uh, I I think I can say with near certainty that uh, she has been to more IEA events than any other politician ever. Uh, and that won't be unique to the IEA. I mean, it would yeah. also be true of other think tanks as well. And it's not just a question of, you know, she likes a Diet Coke or a glass of wine. She's embedded in policy wonkery. And she went to work, of course, for the reform think mm. tank. Up the road, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is she a nerd? Yeah, yeah. totally. Stuff, stuff, but proud, nerd and proud, you know, she's, you know, she thinks, she, you know, she, she's quite judgmental if you don't do maths A-levels. She, mm-hmm. she, she thinks that you know, maths and, and economics, you know, should be driven, driven... Not as judgmental as if you do maths A-level and get a D in it. <laughs> she was even more judgmental but, about that, yeah, I'll tell she, you that. She was Britain's first, you know, proper think tank PM. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, back in the day, you could argue perhaps the great policy minds took a slightly backroom role mm-hmm. and let people with better front of house experience um, uh, sort of take over. You've got to also remember what that 2010 intake was like that she joined. It was a massive intake, but it was also full of quite serious, like people who wanted to be serious players. Everyone was writing pamphlets left, yeah, yeah. left right, and centre, and they got very heavily into their sort of. Um, into their policy sort of almost battles. There were rival rival factions. You had the Eurosceptics, you had the Free Marketeers, you had all sorts of groups. They were all quite battling, all basically trying to get jobs in the in a in a, in a smaller, shrunken pool of jobs because of the coalition. Yeah. But also the, the way the coalition was wired, it meant that actually Tory MPs could have be even though they were in government, could go way further um, you know, attacking government policy essentially, because you could attack the Lib Dems. Um, so it sort of was almost like the perfect intake for her because she came in and, you know, thrived in that and basically campaigned herself into her first ministerial job by taking the issue of childcare, running with it, writing endless god awful pamphlets which I've read. They're just so long. It's, you know, this could have been one, a one pager. Um, uh, and campaigned her way into a, into a policy job. And, and just to add, I mean, you know, she was at Reform from 2006 to 2009, and she is very good at the policy stuff, but she's also got a real flair for a, a turn of phrase for a language, and so she's got that kind of 
eye on advancement, that way of getting it into the report, into the ma mainstream media, uh, places like the Mirror, the Telegraph, etc. So she's got someone who knows what she thinks and has got very firm views on policy. Indeed, she often used to hire spads in the first question she'd ask in an interview about law multiplication. And sort of baffle civil servants by asking them what's one eighth plus one seventh, you know, right, yeah. um, which sits around in Whitehall. Most ministers don't do that. Um, and so, what is it? Two fifteenths. Um, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, one. No. Three, no, one, one, no. One, one, <laughs> I knew the words. Yeah. Uh, I knew numbers and stories. Six, isn't it? <laughs> You wouldn't get a job. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure after the book now, but uh, you know. Um, so she basically has a real flair for that, and that sets her apart. Even in that intake, she's writing. You know, she wrote two books after the coalition and uh, Britannia Unchained, and she also did the Compass pamphlet. Um, sorry, Centre Forum pamphlet, which got her yeah. job on childcare, basically. But, and uh, and then, as you you said right at the top of the show, Harry, she has a she has an incredibly long ministerial career, yeah. and and th this is the bit where, where where you say the inside story of the unexpected rise. I mean, I guess I was sort of looking at think, well, it's not that unexpected. I mean, it's had ebbs and flows, but you sort of. You know, you do a whole range of jobs and gradually move up from childcare minister to yeah. foreign secretary with a, with a few bumps on the way. But actually, I'm trying to think, who was the last prime minister who had served a decade in the cabinet before becoming prime minister? James there's there's my pub quiz. Well, I presume it would Gordon be... Brown, um, well, yeah, called Brown, but before that it would be, I think, uh, Callaghan. Right. Um, so it's not, is that really an unexpected rise? How does well, it rise the, through the, the government? Hit, the unexpected bit, I think, is also... There were some major ups and downs in that in that ministerial career, mm -hmm. so it was perhaps unexpected. I mean, at childcare, she was slightly pushed to one side, having lobbied well, her way to the job. She didn't manage to change uh, childcare stop policy. Stop me right? if you've heard this one before. She came in, she threw grenades everywhere. She tried to completely bulldoze a, a potentially very sensitive, unpopular policy with a very vocal group called Parents. Um, <laughs> and trade unions uh, <laughs> through without any pitch rolling, just announced it was happening and then was left high and dry when the Prime Minister of the day panicked. You could, uh, James, okay. laugh, James laughs because I always say this, but the warning signs were, were there. Right. You know, she did it gonzo style, as someone said, and, and got whacked. And you, for a little bit, it looked like she'd learned the lessons from that. Actually, when her next job, when she was trying to do equally controversial things at at DEFRA, trying to do sort of this 25-year um, environmental plan, which was quite testy in, in, the, in the otherwise dry backwaters of pre-Brexit <coughs> pre DEFRA. Um, she actually was a much more, you know, consensual. She brought people in. She was, you know, she listened. She worked with her ministers. She worked with the NFU. She sort of took the took people with them, so to speak. But then, when she came to prime minister, it, she reverted back to that original way of doing mm -hmm. things, which was. It's very Dom Cummings, actually. She learnt you know, from, from Dom Cummings, which is... Blow things up. Blow things up, and, and if anyone stands in your way, move them. I, I can't have a lengthy interview about Liz Trust without mentioning the infamous cheese speech. <laughs> Again, that, that's what class is an unexpected part of the rise. Um, <laughs> this, I mean, <coughs> I, I always feel it's a bit unfair on politicians that, you know, just a few minutes of their <laughs> career of decades is played back to them, back to them. And uh, if I remember, it was, you know, she, it, 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 it wasn't so much what she was saying. Although what she was saying was actually really anti-free market, that she considered too much mm. of our cheese to be imported rather than mm. you know, make your own cheese. There's a bit of a sort of siege economy approach to, to <laughs> cheese and, and, uh, and, and dairy products. And but, it was, but it was actually the delivery of it. Yeah. And that sort of stuck with her a bit. I mean, a, a, another politician I feel a little bit sorry for, do you remember way back in the day, John Redwood, when yeah, he was Welsh, Welsh Secretary, yeah, was yeah. sort of pretending to mouth the words of the Welsh National Anthem with clearly not knowing them. And again, the sort of in an illustrious career, these this thirty seconds seems to stick. Um, is that just good banter for shows like Have I Got News for You, or does that actually undermine somebody's political career? Because if it does, no wonder politicians are so goddamn cautious, right? Mm. I think also it shows that. I mean, the, the, it's the lost art of the platform oratory, and basically it's very difficult to give a good conference speech, I'd say, if uh, you're doing it for the first time. And actually, you know, talking to talking to people around her, I think it was difficult because CCHQ had done this training and they had to do this weird posture thing, remember, this, the legs standing apart, and the way in which you're told to deliver it. You're meant to deliver it in a way which will get you applause in the conference hall, but also will make you come across as sensible at home. That's why you can't sort of be passionate. On, on those two 
opposite poles. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 on some horrific corporate management like right. training right. sessions. Oh, it's it's a good show. Yeah, the show. Yeah, and the interesting thing is the original actually reception for the first three days was fine. Yeah, the, the Telegraph wrote it up nicely. It's a boilerplate DEFRA it's minister's speech. speech. And, yeah. then, and then a few days later, how I got news pitching it, and uh, Jennifer Saunders picked it up. And it was the. the it yeah. was the effect. But also, it, it plays into the fact that communications is not her forte. She will be the first person to say that. At her best, Liz Truss is someone who went, right, I am shit at this. How, what do I need to do and who do I need to help me to be less shit at this? Mm -hmm. And that worked in the campaign. She spent days planning, you know, that first Channel 4 debate she came out was terrible. She spent a whole weekend basically stopping, you know, training, practicing, rehearsing with TV professionals. Um, and she, that was a, quite a scarring moment. She, she laughs it off now and you know, she you know, talks about her daughter playing it on YouTube and, and how other ministers in meetings will, you know, will do it as the punchline. But it, is, it, it, did, it did hurt. So, uh, and let, she did try to, to, to change, that, change that. Very briefly, I mean, the, the ebbs and flows of her career, she, you know, she, we've mentioned childcare, she does de DEFRA, she does justice, mm. where I don't think she was considered a particularly great success. She's, got, she, she's a rock and a hard place. She, she, gets, caught, she, gets, sort of, she gets sort of demoted to Chief Secretary of the yeah. Treasury, I mean, sideways or downwards. Let's come to her, the Brexit referendum, mm. which for you know, a large number of MPs, I suppose particularly Conservatives, the Conservative Party was more divided than most other parties on the matter. I don't think there were any UKIP MEPs for Remain, and I don't think there were any Lib Dem MPs for Leave. Um, she, she plumps for Remain. They, fair enough. I mean, the IEA staff were divided on the topic, but this doesn't seem to quite go with the grain of the woman who is a grenade throwing knock over the apple cart let's blow everything up start again from year zero and yet here but she is going for the status quite quite. ambitious mm. right so she thought she basically said to someone at a party in that summer before the referendum when it was looking like you know when everyone was sort of starting to divide as you know, Remain are going to win. What's the point of pissing off the Prime Minister? Mm -hmm. You know, what's, why, 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 why waste the political capital? She will always have, she'll cross the road for a fight if she thinks it's a fight worth having and a fight she can win. She's also been perfectly willing to sit in a government and let all sorts of things like mm -hmm. nanny state nonsense that she just fundamentally disagrees with pass because she thinks well, that's not a battle worth having. And I think that's with Brexit. She thought, this is not a fight worth having. And I think the, the David Cameron approach of, do you want to spend the next 10 years of your life talking about this nonsense? And lo and behold, this is what's happened. Do you want to spend the your rest of your career in frontline politics fixing this problem was quite powerful to a lot of those sort of, you know, second tier cabinet ministers yep. who could see that, you know, the way that it was going and actually it would be easier <coughs> for the remaining one. And then the other point I would just make very quickly before James comes in was, um, you know, she genuinely, I think, thought that Britain, you know, outside of the EU would not have anyone else to blame uh, mm -hmm. in a weird way and actually would probably become slightly more insular. Actually, in, when it comes to market economics, actually being in a big right. massive trade block helped. Yeah, I think she thinks uh, Brussels wasn't the cause or solution to any of our sort of problems. And actually, it was in Westminster, there was a real you know, danger that lies. Yeah. It's worth pointing out, she wasn't a sort of starry eyed Europhile, which is probably why she, she switched basically on the night itself and became, um, you know, a pragmatic. A reliever, uh, you know, is that uh, called? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And yeah. actually became quite boosterish in later years and uh, about the opportunities of Brexit. Certainly a trade. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and seeing the benefits of that. And that's always very her. She's very sort of glass half full, as you know, which is quite why she got so behind it. And um, actually, she was She's a Democrat as well. Yeah, public, yeah, public yeah, voted in. And you, know, and you could see the, you know, the, the the battle to try and rerun that was just was was more toxic than the result. She was quite low key in the referendum as well as the second tier cabinet mm -hmm. in the Rook's time. And, and then uh, let, let's move forward to her throwing her hat in the ring. I mean, we've we've now had um, with the fall of Truss and, uh, and Sunak becoming prime minister five Conservative Prime Ministers in a row for I think the first time ever. Mm. I'm not sure we've ever had five Conservative Prime Ministers in a row. Um, obviously, when Theresa May uh, is removed, that's what, all of the momentum goes behind Boris Johnson, and yeah. then the, the Johnson administration um, falls to pieces over a whole range of sort of uh, an accumulation of scandals and misjudgments, I guess, rather, um, and a kind of sense of ennui. Um, and she throws her hat in the ring. Did you think at that stage she was? you know, a, a likely winner, as, as it became evident or likely that Boris Johnson was going to exit? 
Boris Johnson, so rewind to 2000, late 2021, so, so autumn 21, and I think Johnson would have liked to have fired Sunak if he could have done, but didn't have the political capital to do mm-hmm. it. Um, and also uh, just, you know, was getting, you know, the golden boy of Tory party politics, Mr. Furlow, the guy that saved the economy, <laughs> um, or then claiming to have, you know, by, you know, kept people's, people's jobs. Um, you know, he was a popular guy, but also the, di- the economic differences were already there. They were already having their tensions in, in, in how they get out of the, the mess of, of COVID. And so I think the day that he appoints Liz Truss foreign secretary, was the day that Johnson put her on the trajectory to be the leader mm-hmm. of the Conservative Party, to be his replacement. He couldn't fire Sunak, but he could clip his wings. And that was a clear sign. Or put somebody else in the front. Yeah, it was a very clear sign to the Chancellor. If you come at the King, you're not going to get a clean shot. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a contest, because now there's now two big cabinet beasts. Mm-hmm. And from then, I think it was a, tra- tra- a train in motion. And then that morning that... Um, Nadine Dorries and Jacob Rees-Mogg came out of cabinet on the Tuesday morning and said, we're backing Liz, on the steps of Downing Street, which they would not have been able to do without a tacit mm. nod from him indoors, to say, you could see the entire Johnson machine suddenly fling behind Liz. And that's when I think, if, for, if she could just get to the final two... And so, so does that actually, that, although it's also say she's anti-establishment, she's got some radical and slightly wonky and detailed policy ideas, actually... When it comes to it in politics, it was being a loyalist, and the, 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 and you know this has happened before. You could sort of see Sunak as the Heseltine type mm. character, and you know he who wields the knife doesn't inherit the throne. Was that again a sort of cynical ploy? I will I will keep very close to prove my loyalty points to the party, the uh, the likely outgoing prime minister, and the rest of it, rather than here I stand, I can do no other, which is kind of what Rishi Sunak and Sajid Javid said. You know, we're out, we can't put up with this. Well, and this was the irony, and she spent a lot of the time in the 2010s, I think, being a little bit uh, disloyal and mischief-making in the cabinet, and ultimately it was that loyalty. But of course, there was um, the policy difference as well, which was the national insurance rise in the summer of 2021, and she and Rishi took very different points of view of that. Ultimately, Boris reluctantly swung behind Rishi Sunak on that. But I think that was a key point because it meant that Rishi couldn't attack her over tax and that proves to be something in the campaign. Uh, but just to add as well, I mean, you know, as soon as she becomes Foreign Secretary, uh, the betting odds immediately make her the second favourite to succeed after Sunak. So there was always a chance, I think. There's a lot of profiles of her at the end of 2021 and then she had a good war in Ukraine. So she was always going to be, I think, one of the top two or three to succeed Boris when he fell. Well, so the ability to also uni- unite the right as well, the ability to unite the Johnson, you know, mm-hmm. mob so to speak, with the ERG, who had, who had fallen out, essentially, yeah. under Boris. She, by playing a very clever game on the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, essentially drafting that bill hand-in-hand hand at every stage with the ERG, they, despite her Ramona past, managed to convince themselves that she was one of them and actually was, was trust, more trusted than Sunak, ironically, who had back leave. So she was able to bring the ERG and the Johnson clan back together by not being Boris Johnson. Um, and that was, that was key to getting her over that line. And then when, when it goes to the membership, she suddenly becomes the hot favourite. And again, do you think this was because um, her opponent then, it had been whittled down to just her and Sunak to go to the membership, was, was seen as having not been loyal to Boris Johnson? Or, from a free market perspective, can I try and draw some shred of optimism from what's occurred over the last few months that uh, actually her broad approach of a sort of boosterism, entrepreneurialism, taxes are too high, the government has too big a role in our lives, regulation are too tight, essentially resonates within her party. I mean, if true, that would be true for another candidate who runs on a similar platform at some point in the future, right? Yeah, I think so. And I think that... um you know, Sunak makes a mistake in that he's, a, he's pitching to the financial markets during that leadership race and, and the country rather than the party actually want to be voting on what they want to hear. And I do think that there was questions about uh, Rishi Sunak's um, you know, handling of the record the last couple of years, which is pro- partly why uh, Liz Truss was seen as winning on that particular issue. Um, but also, you know, I think... Uh, Tax cuts, for instance, was obviously popular, and I think that what she said in the campaign was. Well, it was actually cancelling tax rises, just yes, to be sorry, clear, was it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, just, so just, just so we're clear on the record. Here. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so I think that um, there's a lot that's seen as attractive. So I don't think Sunak had a particularly strong economic record to stand on. I think also she's just a better, she's just a better politician. If, if, if we could count politicians as uh, someone in the art of winning elections, for one, she was running, to, she was running an election and 
was vaguely aware of what the electorate wanted. in front of her wanted to hear. Yeah. And, and you know, he was again, he was sort of running, he did, ran a very good leadership election to replace Keir Starmer. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's it's this is going on out live, isn't it? Oh God. Um, <laughs> so he um, yeah, yeah, but he, he ran she, it as if it was a general election, yeah, exactly. not an internal party. Exactly, exactly. spot on. And the problem is, is that she, you know, there's another great example when someone says to her, "Why are you dressing like Margaret Thatcher in the leadership debates?" And she says, have you, never, have you never met the Conservative Party? The people that are going to vote in this election really like Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, so before I come over to questions from the audience, which we'll do in a few minutes, so uh, if you do have a question, um, uh, think it through and catch my eye in just a few minutes. We've, we've got to go through the, the collapse of it, because this, mm. is a, this is a slightly heroic story at this point, sort of, you know, a girl against the odds who's a bit anti-establishment and has a sort of wily sort of you know, uh, certain political savvy, but nevertheless has a fairly clear view of where she wants to take yeah. the nation. She's in. And the establishment 44 days, it collapses. So what, you know, I mean, this is a very open-ended question. What went wrong? I mean, it didn't just go wrong. I mean, spectacularly wrong. Almost everything that could go wrong went wrong. Yeah, those two, the three immovable forces came together, and one was bad luck. Let's get that one out of the way because it's the least... What was the bad luck? Timing. Um, the death of the monarch completely um, upended her first sort of contact with the, the wider public. Right. If that makes sense. Everyone was sort of, you know, her first impressions of uh, the country got to see of her were, were pretty tied up. She's at her best as a politician when she's unchained. Trust Unchained, where she's out there being boosterish, doing crazy stuff, photo stunts, promoting Britain around the world, being unconventional as a politician. She's at her you worst. You can't do that in a morning she, period. She's yeah. at her worst when she's stuck behind a podium right. and chained into, you know, saying all you know, things that no Prime Minister ever wanted, news no Prime Minister ever wanted to announce. That was the first bit that was really unfair for her because she, her first 10 days she was buckled in. That said, fatal mistakes had already been made in the run-up to her, her, her winning. It was so obvious that she was going to win for most of August that she'd already sort of built this shadow government in waiting. Um, and James could get into the, the mistakes that were made there. But that was a mistake to build a shadow government? Uh, to shut yourself off, in a way, before you're even in the building, to start basically surrounding yourselves by the civil service and maybe slowly squeezing people that have been with you for a long time um, out of your circle of advice. I think was was a fatal error, and then there's one more thing, but we can we can talk about this first. No, no, I was just going to say. I mean, the, the simple answer is, is the mini budget and the difficulty of once you've lost market mobility of then having to go back and um, try and regain that. And I think the what we're talking about is that that period in late August, early September of Chevening, which was basically alone at the Foreign Secretary's house. Uh, I think some assumptions that were baked in there and then only worsened in that kind of weird period where it was the official morning period only got worse, created the mini budget co con conditions. Um, and I think at that point, where mistakes around, you can talk about Quasi's interview afterwards where he said, you know, there's more to come. You can talk about the way in which the 45p tax cut was done just a week before Labour conference and they made loads of political capital of that. And then once the mini budget was basically torn apart, at that point it was kind of all over and a waiting game but, and then the fracking vote finished. The, prob the problem was also you got the energy, the energy price cap, which is you spent the whole summer saying, I'm not going to do bailouts, and then you do the biggest bailout known to man. Yeah. And you don't tell anyone you're going to do this. And yes, there was a political consensus for it. But I think she confused political consensus for economic consensus. And there was no economic consensus for it. And she should have basically realised that the scale of that thing she decided to do was so big, she'd have to rein back on the tax cut side of things, at least in the short term. She, she was in too much of a hurry. The problem was she allowed the... Uh, the, 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 the energy bailout to grow so big because she never want, she basically didn't want it to be a distraction from her wider agenda. I think also she then she put her head on her pillow and thinking, I'm about to go down as, you know, I'm going to do a bigger market intervention than furlough. And it was uncosted. Um, so I, then I think in a weird way she started to sort of overcompensate for her right. ideological reasons by going further and faster on the tax cut stuff. I think, genuinely think she might think she was going to get outflanked on the right by someone like Sue Ella or, or something like that. And so you bundle all of that together without an OBR forecast, which we can have debate till the cows come home, the undemocratic nature of that, the political nature of that was that was going to be the hammer they were going to clobber you with. 
at the same time as shutting out not only our own advisors and our own close circle, also shutting out anyone that backed Rishi Sunak. And you've got the perfect environment for a, well, a clusterfuck. And you've got to remember that Tory conference as well. Michael Gove was on manoeuvres. I think they were all manoeuvres. Yeah. Ten conference events. You got to do more than. But, but it is still an extraordinary thing, isn't it? To last only 44 yeah. days. I mean, the, 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 the recipe of, OK, things aren't going well, I've had a stroke of bad luck, or this didn't land very well. I mean, other budgets haven't landed particularly well. Yeah, uh, this I, is I, fairly I, fundamental. You know, pri- 44 once days. You th- once you've thrown yourself... She threw herself to the wolves, is essentially the problem. Once you U-turn once, you U-turn at all. Getting rid of the corporation... We, reversing the... 45p rate, we could, you, she could have survived that U-turn easily. Once you decided to allow Jeremy Hunt to put up corporation tax to what, 25%. It came to a fundamental question of what is the point of Liz Truss without all the tax cuts? Because mm-hmm. if you're just going to be another, you know, Rishi in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in dressed up as Margaret Thatcher, then, you know, what is the point? Actually, why not have Rishi? Why not have... Some, without the radicalism, without the tax-cutting agenda, all she was was, you know, was Liz Truss. If you can let Jeremy Hunt... Run so the was country, it an error of hers to sack... Oh, yeah. that, as soon as she fired him, she was done. Uh, I think also we forget some of the pain that was involved in it. Every time there was a crisis, things seemed to make worse. Do you remember that BBC local interview round where one after another just... Uh, and there was that. I mean, there was things like that awful press conference, the eight-minute press conference. Um, every time there was a chance for her to kind of explain what's happened, kind of contextualise. And the ultimate thing she couldn't explain was this. Why did she sack Kwasi Kwarteng if he was in full agreement yeah. with her agenda? And why wouldn't she go as well? And that was she couldn't. And really also, explain. I think the, the, the Tory party have got PTSD from Theresa May as well, in the fact that actually they could have they could have got rid of Theresa May in 2017 after the election disaster, and they quarter, on, quarterized yeah. that rather than allowing it to cling on for 18 months. But I this was, were, there was a similar situation of right if we're going to if we're going to do it, do it quickly rather than doing do it let it drag into another year. I'll come to questions in a minute, but I want to. Uh, what, what are the the lessons for free marketeers here, rather than for the Conservative Party? I mean, do you think that? Um, I mean, I hate this modern phrase, but it's used over and over again that the pitch had not been rolled, right? So, so uh, the, the the argument sort of went that you know she was trying to do all of these things. I mean, the, the way I summed it up in some. Um, media interviews is that she correctly analysed that the patient had brain cancer, but that was not a reason to take a chainsaw to the patient's skull, (laughs) right? But she hadn't explained to the patient that they had brain cancer. So obviously the patient then is rather resistant to the treatment. And there was a sort of assumption that sort of everybody understands that growth has been anemic, that the public finances are in a terrible state, that taxes on the rich are on the wrong side of the Laffer curve. These were taken as assumptions yeah. that the Conservative Party, the media, the wider electorate sort of already knew. And it's OK, I'm going to go and fix that. But to go and fix a problem that most people do not yet analyse as a problem, I think that could be one reason why it went haywire. And do you think there's a lesson for those of us at the IEA, that we should just do more sort of, you know, here is the scale of the national debt, here is the size of the tax burden, here is how regulation uh, clamps down, you know, this is the consequence of a continually low growth rate. All of that was taken as if it was in the cerebral cortex of the entire electorate. I think two things, one of which is planning, and I remember, of course, I mean, the woman who looms over all this is Margaret Thatcher, and of course she was someone who came in 1979 you know, put up tax in that 81 budget, you know, she, she d- ducks the fight with the miners in 1981 over coal supplies because they're not ready, and then she picks her battles when it's time to do it, and I think Liz Truss came in and was trying to do too much too fast, and I think that's the second thing, was a misunderstanding of how government works, you can't pull all the levers at once, it's a much more managed and much more broader approach, so I think that combined in a kind of frenzy 24-7 media rage made it very difficult in order to respond, so a lack of planning and a lack of preparation for fallout. Fundamental issue of honesty as well in, in the scale of her plans. In the fact that she stood in that first in that first weekend of the campaign, she basically realised that Rishi was boxed into a, into a corner. He couldn't run. He's not. He wasn't going to run against his own record. So he could. They were basically were fine on the tax front. Mm-hmm. They didn't have to go quote tonto on it. So, you know, if she'd just done the cancelling the corporation tax rise and, and the next rise and the next yeah. rise. She would have got. It would have been fine. That's that's what people thought she was going to do. That was pe- what people prepared to do. That was what the pitch was rolled. It would have been rough, rough with, on top of the energy price cap. But then to throw in everything and say I've only got two years. I've only got two years. You know, 
to then throw in everything just without without even telling anyone. Not I mean, not even telling people in Downing Street. People on Downing Street were watching yeah. the budget on television. The Bank of England found out what was in the budget that morning, and you just think. That's no way to go about yeah. things. Context matters too, of course. Remember that Thatcher, for instance, came in after winning a general election. This is three years into a five-year parliament with a divided party to 12 years. Very difficult to change tack yeah. at that case. And uh, also abolishing, the, abolishing the 45p rate on the eve of Labour conference. It's just, it's just bad politics. Mm -hmm. Let me come to the floor. We've got about 10 minutes left. Has anybody got a question from the floor? I've got plenty more. Well, so we've got two here. Andrew at the, uh, the front. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I wonder if I could press back to um, uh, James and Harry on what you actually expected yourselves. You were obviously you know, researching this book, you'd known quite a bit about it, probably more than most people outside her family now oh. in terms of talking to people. And when she became Prime Minister, what did you expect her to do rather than what she then did? Because you're, you're, you're showing me that you're surprised about the way it went. I wondered what in your thoughts she was going to do. Well, I think normal pace of politics doesn't go... Um, the way, I mean, like, you know, we talked about Theresa May after that 2017 snap election, and she lasted for more than two years after that. Um, I don't think we expected Liz Truss to be out of power like this. I mean, there was perhaps, I think, a lot of clues that it was going to end uh, badly, but not in the kind of space... Um, but you know, not speedily. E speedily, exactly, mm. put it like that. Um, I think when we, th we, we she got elected, we thought she'd be there till the next election, like most of the Conservative MPs, the commentary out on that front. But I think as we sort of uncovered more and more, we saw that she... You know, we saw her great strengths and great weaknesses, and unfortunately, in the context in which she operated, I think her her ability to shoot from the hip and being quite undiplomatic really backfired when she was trying to appease you know the financial markets, and that's where it all went wrong. I'd say. I think my personal view is that I would have I thought the Tory Party would have given her a, a bit more time, um, and I think the I think there could have been that that, that could have that could have been allowed to happen had they sort of slightly broadened out the cabinet, the ministerial appointments, dip some hands in the blood, bring people in, make them go out on TV and defend your your, your, your policies. Um, I think if you could have done that with some of the sort of bigger beasts, I think... I, I, I You mean yeah, Shaps and Gove? Shaps right? and Gove and, and Co. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that could have been... That could have been I thought the Tory party's uh, survival instinct would have been to close ranks and and take the and 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 go into sort of you know, praetorian sort of mode in the way that they're very good at. Um, it, in fact, they decided to actually you know do it all again. Having you know they've got a taste of blood. You know there's so many factions now that you know, no 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 one wing of the party is ever going to be completely happy, and they're not happy with what they've got. However hard some of them are pretending to be now. Um, that you know, in that sort of Lord of the Flies way, they've they've, they've chosen essentially the path of decline mm -hmm. and the path of, 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 of division. And I thought I mis mis misjudged the mood and thought they'd actually at least try and hold the line a bit. But you know, Tory conference exploded within two weeks of her premiership. And I think the Rishi Sunak premiership. So many of the decisions are a reaction to that Liz Truss government. And you see, like they where they climbed down on planning last week. I'm not sure Liz Truss would have done that if that was if she was in government. But it's a reaction. They don't want to do the same thing. So it's interesting. Although it's about recent past, it's also about a guide perhaps to future in terms of how much it scars on the top people, the top of number 10 are running the country. I'll take George at the back first. There's a few others who want to come in. Yeah. Hi, I, I, I have a question which I think might be quite a difficult one to answer, <laughs> um, which is um, what exactly was happening about uh, pensions and the mini budget? Uh, because I can't see um, a connection uh, between the mini budget and the so called problem. So, and my back, background is actuarial, so I, I have some of an interest in, in pension uh, funds. And I look at the gilts market, and through all of this year, right from the beginning of January, uh, the gilts um, have been going down very, very steadily. Mm. Um, and depending whether you look at short or long, they've been down between 20% or 60%. So it was a, an asset class we didn't want to get into. Um, and you look at uh, you look at these graphs, and if you show these graphs to someone from Mars and ask them to pinpoint the mini budget, they can't. They wouldn't find it. Mm. It's a non-event. Um, the problem with these LDIs uh, would be were obvious to anyone who's financially literate. Mm. Um, they were uh, being discussed um, more than four years ago. Um, preparation for the inevitable um, that would follow when interest rates went up. I mean, could have been done. Uh, the, the Bank of England's response was to say, and keep saying as they did, uh, I think it was last week in front of the House of Lords, we were one hour away from a, 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 a disaster. I mean, that's like 
was there really a crisis of that nature. They, they printed 20 billion, which they haven't unprinted, and they didn't have to do that. So, uh, so what's the question? The question, the question is, what, what is happening? Well, why, why, why was there this um, overreaction? Or why, why is the narrative that there was a problem? This is, this is fascinating, because but, but, but both of you have mentioned the mini-budget as being sort of when the fast unravelling started. And I've heard all sorts of things here. Firstly, that it was badly communicated, people didn't know. Uh, the second more, I'm not suggesting that George implied this, it might be just me, me inferring it, it's a slightly more sort of tinfoil hat view that, that, you know, that we're going to now deliberately pin this on Truss and Quartang and we'll, we'll say, there you go, that's proof that you can't do these sort of reforms and the, you know, in, in a battle between an insurgent prime minister and the establishment, the establishment won. And as George says, what's the sort of, you know, was it all, all that, that much of a deal? Do you remember George Osborne's Omni Shambles budget? I mean, that didn't bring down the government? I think the, yeah, look, there is definitely an element of people around this trials, uh, and some of her supporters who definitely feel they were stitched up like an absolute kicker. Um, the IMF intervention uh, on day, three days after the mini budget was unprecedented in its, yeah. in its personal nature and it's wading into essentially domestic politics. Um, you can point a finger from Tom Scholar, you know, the Sachs Treasury um, Mandarin. You can draw a line from him to, to the IMF where he worked for many years. You can, yeah, there is definitely an idea that you know, Andrew Bailey was particularly miffed and was not going to use So, so the, the, the Trussite right is going to get into these spider grams, are they? That there's sort of some <laughs> yeah, establishment yeah. stitch up linking Carol all of these Cadwalla, people. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to get my printstick yeah, and my compass yeah, yeah, out and start yeah, drawing yeah. them. Uh, not quite, but there's, there is definitely a resentment that they were treated in a different way. To to you know, have they been you know good um, good sort of you know, IMF mm. types? Um, I think the problem for Truss is actually I think this is probably where we'll see her future career going is actually that, and you can see it in her first choice of visit um, post PM is to go to Cato and, and Heritage Foundation places like that. And actually, you can see by the way that Joe Biden weaponized it so quickly during the midterms of actually, you know, don't do it, you know, don't let the Republicans do what Liz Truss do to Britain. She's in danger of becoming a sort of apocryphal tale for this, you know, this failed experiment. But you could also argue, and I'm going to say it, real, real trustonomics was never tried. Mm -hmm. It was never actually tried. You can't say it's failed if, you mm -hmm. know, you pull the plug before it was even allowed to... It wasn't to on the launch pad. It, well, it was on the launch exactly. pad, it was not launched. The, I think all of that will come out of the wash. There was a... There is definitely a... We didn't really have time to get into the book, so we will get it to into it in the, in the paperback edition. But the, 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 the way the Treasury moved into gear, as soon as Kwarteng flew to the IMF on about the Wednesday, about ten days later, the Treasury and the Cabinet Office and the Cabinet Secretary basically gave her this doomsday scenario that you know we will you know we will literally be uh, the equivalent of trying to sell third third world debt if you don't you tend to and she said this damning line which was last time i ignored all these people they were proven to be right i can't ignore them this time um and so you know you can definitely can see the machine mm -hmm. closing ranks yeah i think the real danger of this thing obviously this trust made mistakes i think obviously what happened to the government Politicians can't evade blame for that, but I think there are wider institutional issues as well, and I think British policy making will will be in denial if it doesn't try to address some of the issues around, you know, the Bank of England, the way that operated, the kind of context that was going on, how the Treasury reacted. Um, to you can't deny things. the fact that the pound did crash to its lowest level ever. It was yes, it was been going down like that. But I've never understood why. I've never understood why a high pound and low interest rates is what we should be striving for. <laughs> I don't have any particular view of what the value of the pound should be, rather than the economics so much. I think in the context which would happen. I think to the time when the, the BBC basically have the you know, a graph of the pound on television for 48 hours, you start getting you know very clucky Tory MPs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me take another question, uh, lady over there. on the party now, given that um, the membership were given the choice between Truss and Sunak, and have ended up with Sunak, the loser, being mm. imposed on them without further reference to them, without a vote. And um, it strikes me that there may, I'm not a member, so I don't know what it feels like, but I would imagine that there, that there would seem to be a sort of almost a civil war between party members and the parliamentary party, 
Well, they've already seen over the weekend, I think there was uh, new plans for launch for the Conservative Democracy Organisation with uh, yeah. uh, Peter Crudus and um, Priti Patel. Um, the former felt aggrieved over how Boris Johnson was forced out and then the latter perhaps over some more um, other issues as well. So I think that there's definitely a move within the party to kind of restore some kind of democratic uh, grassroots control over what the central does and what the party does. I think it's just basically uh, there's a lot of ill feeling, bad tempers, some of the trust I supporters feel that they got stitched up as I say so um, it's just going to be more bad blood which I think will play out in opposition. Yeah I mean, what is the point of paying it when it's going to get up to 38 quid or something now is it what is the point of paying that money if you're not going to get a say in things and um, I can bore on about this for ages but the, 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 the contract between the central party and the membership used to be that the, the membership could choose their MP. They could, they could have much more power in selecting who became a member of parliament and they left it up to, lead, to the MPs they chose to pick the leader on their behalf. William Hague then tore that up and actually centralised the power of picking politicians and you can argue how well that's gone in the last 15 years. Um, and in return, the, the, leaders, the, the membership got a nod on who would be the leader. Now, that's broken now because the MPs have wrestled not only the control of, of who, the, who, who joins their ranks, which is all done through central office now, and associations are presented with three candidates, from an approved list, um, they've also now wrestled back control of the who, party leadership. who the party leadership is. So, essentially, you've got a completely broken membership model. Mm -hmm. And who would be surprised that you know members decide actually, you know what, I've got better things to do on Saturday morning than knocking up for, yeah. you know, Joe Bloggs. Gentlemen, just next to the lady, ask the question there, right. um, and then I'll come to the front. You have said a lot, and, and, and it's <laughs> been a wonderful magisterial uh, analysis <laughs> of parliamentary politics, um, of the decline of a nerd. Now, her most nerdish job was in trade. Mm. Now, she sometimes criticised that some of the trade agreements are not as substantial as they were held out to be. There's a lot in the small print, and my clients have benefited from it. Nonetheless, what do you think of her performance in trade and the number of agreements she managed to conclude ignoring for the moment the substance of the agreements. Did she manage on trade? This was going back a bit to her having been Remain, but then trying to be boosterist about Brexit. I think the Department for International Trade was, wasn't it, uh, wittily renamed by some civil servants there as oh. the Department for the Instagram of Trust, <laughs> I think, yeah. Um, that it became sort of it, lots of photo opportunities with Union Jacks and other flags mm. behind, and we're going to, you know, we're all told it's going to take seven years to ever get a trade deal, yeah. but I can do it in seven minutes and all of the rest of it. What was the, so, was that all fluff or was there something to that? The problem was when she came in for her was actually a lot of the trade deals, so the Japan deal, the New Zealand deal, the Australia deal, uh, at the time the America deal were all at a very technical level, mm -hmm. so uh, at quite an unsexy level of of you know she was she was she was on top of the details of stuff. She was surprised to I hate, always hate that expression when people, officials were surprised, but the minister was actually you know read their papers and was on top of it and could actually question them and tell, tell how them unusual. Them. <laughs> yes, exactly. It was very worrying that that's a, deemed as a surprising, unexpected perhaps. Um, part of uh, part of a minister's life, but they, the, where they were with the trade negotiations, especially on Japan, um, which was one of her sort of early wins, and Australia it was very bogged down in the in the in the technocratic, you know. Um, well, that's the nature of trade deals, isn't it? Exactly. So at the same time as that, she she's got a department that is actually very 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 technical heavy. How can you make it interesting and relatable? And I think that was one of the clever things she did. You can criticise her for it, but she put that department on the map. Yeah. It was one of the only during the grimness of COVID. It. it was one of the only government departments that actually had any good news mm -hmm. to sell and, and to say. But having said that, if you were to judge purely on her ambitions when she walked into the department, which was, I'm going to sign the biggest fr free trade deal with the United States any country's ever seen, no, fundamentally happened. a failure. I think that was a failure out of her control. I think the American politics, political mm -hmm. situation said more about it than that, and also number 10's reticence to get into a fight with the NHS. Uh, over the NHS. Um, so y it's a mixed bag. The Australia deal, for example, again, big headline. I've got an Australia, a, free, a tariff free, quota free deal with Australia that no one else has ever achieved. 
small print over 15 years. So yeah. it's actually going to be a, a very phased out. So there are wins there, but wins and, 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 and losses. Let me try and squeeze in just two final questions from the two gentlemen at the front. And then, <laughs> if we take, let, let's take these two uh, yeah, and then come back to you as we're a little over time. Okay, so it's a very British conversation, but I was wondering if there shouldn't be a bit of geopolitics in this, in the sense that it's possible to argue that the Western governments have undermine their stability through the Ukrainian sanctions or Russian sanctions, and that this trust was just another regime that's kind of been dismastered by that and couldn't say, maybe you should get out of the sanctions. Are we sure we're not just dealing with infighting between two geopolitical factions, where they put up Boris, he gets knocked out, they put up trust, the other side puts up soon after. Right? Is this a process that's going to continue like this? Interesting. And then right at the front. <laughs> Sorry, my questions are, are obviously very, very parochial. Really a variant of uh, what um, uh, Mark Littlewood asked earlier. Um, when I picked up your book in the bookshop, I looked in the index to see whether the IEA featured, and it didn't. But if you look at any newspaper account of um, the trust government, the IEA and similar are constantly called in, in, in parade in aid, as it were. And I wondered what, what you thought the IEA should be doing to not to distance themselves from it, but to to um, make clear that there is a future for mm. free market thought and similar, and it hasn't been completely trashed by the 44 days. You should be doing my job, sir. <laughs> yeah, that was the first question I should have asked. Uh, <laughs> just to tell the first point about an index, well, Harry and I have both seen... We didn't, we, didn't, we didn't have an index because uh, we've seen there isn't an index. Yeah, we've seen politicians walk in before, look up themselves in the back, look up the reference, chuckle, and put the book back on the shelf and not walk out. The, the IEA is in there. The, the IEA is in there. Quite a bit. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the IEA does feature. Um, I, I think. Look, I think that already a certain section of the party is much more willing now to um, kind of embrace some of those ideas. Now they've got the alternative back on the table, which is you know, Sunak's agenda, etc. And I think that you know the early moves from say Simon Clark, who's someone who was close to his trust ally and friend, and he's now getting up this new organisation, Next Generation Tory. So I think there's definitely going to be something that plays out in the future. Um, I mean, I think just, just IEA, the IEA, people always come back to the IEA because it's as, got a sort of permanence. As, Ma as, Mark said, uh, as Mark said earlier, Liz Truss is the only politician in modern history to reduce the tax burden. So we should be banging that drum, I think. Um, you got to keep fighting the fight, of course. And she will, I think. I think, you know, she's lost a battle. I think she thinks she's lost a battle, doesn't, hasn't lost a war. And this place has been around longer than any, you know, any one... More than, days, yeah. more than 44 more than, days. More than 44 days. More than 40, much more than 44 years. PMs yeah. and DGs, you yeah, know, nearly, come and go. Right, yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, um, on the sanctions point, um, I, think you're, I, think you're, I think you're right in the fact that uh, a lot of Western governments have been uh, naive in, to themselves and to the public mm -hmm. about the cost of, of what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Parking the issue of whether it's right or not, I happen mm -hmm. to think it is the right thing to do. But they have been fundamentally dishonest with the, pub with the public, the voting public, about the scale of what the decisions that were taken by Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, Ben Wallace in those early days um, mean. That said, I think the political drumbeat for sanctions was, was deafening. You know, the unity of the EU, the, um, the United States and the, and the UK, you know, meant that they, they sort of boxed each other in, in, in a way, and everyone had to go further and faster to not be, appear to be outpaced. But it, it, the, the energy bailout and the fallout from that is, you know, the cows coming home to crow, crow cows, crows <laughs> coming home to roost on that. In the fact that, hang on, everything comes to the price tag. It's like furlough. It's like COVID. You know, everyone like Rishi Sunak when he's giving out sweeties. No one likes Jeremy Hunt, who's now picking up the tab. And I, it's just a, I think the numbers and the scale of of interventions now involved in politics, people just get baffled. We, once you go over a billion or five billion or ten billion, what's a hundred billion, yeah. you know? And that's the, the issue is the fundamental brokenness of, of our political system at the moment is that there is a dishonesty about the scale of numbers involved and people don't realise and aren't being told and are, and, and are, are now at the at the coalface of, 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 of what that actually means in reality, and that goes way further than the uh, Ukraine. I think actually, what you touch on is context, and that's so important. And so she comes to power at a time when the era of cheap borrowing is coming to an end, when yep. you see like the borrowing costs, which was a huge factor in the subsequent fallout debate about the, the mini budget, about going up by eight billion kind of a day, that's a huge amount of money. So a lot of these things is the timing, and so when she came into power, a lot she would pick up the tab for previous administrations. Costs yeah, I think as well. she thought she was sort of slightly unfair. She's like, we've got the lowest, she kept saying, we've got the low, second lowest debt ratio in the G7. Why can't I? Why can't I make it worse? <laughs> um, yeah, and, and you just think, oh God, yeah. 
And on that note... Uh, well, on that cheery, <laughs> on that cheery, cheery <laughs> note, um, uh, thanks for those of you who've braved the weather to come. Sorry we've run slightly over time. Uh, for those of you watching on uh, YouTube afterwards, we'll make sure that there's a link in the show notes below to uh, how you can purchase the book off Amazon. For those of you who are here who haven't bought the book yet, or if you have purchased it and have it with you, I think Harry and James are very happy to sign in this room. Uh, but please, at the back for but, uh, but, but please, uh, please, once Stocking you bought your, once you bought your book, uh, join us in the room opposite for a, uh, another drink. Uh, if you are a member of the IEA Book Club or an IEA donor, thank you very much. As I always say, it is our donors who make our work possible, and the politicians and the media who make our work necessary. Um, if you are not a member of the book club but would like to become one, please speak to Alex Lee in the room or email bookclub at iea.org.uk. Thank you very much again for joining us, but please give a very warm round of applause to Harry Cole and James Hill for a wonderful entertainment over the last hour. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast. <laughs>